Hello again, everybody. Uh, Clinical Manager Floyd Miracle here. I want to share um, some of my thoughts and some uh, cases, interesting cases, and some data on transcutaneous pacing. Um, I think that this is frequently uh, mismanaged, and I think it's because of how we were taught and the simulations we were that were used to teach us transcutaneous pacing and the, the pacing strips we're used to seeing aren't all that realistic. So I'm going to share some actual cases with you and we're going to have a discussion about transcutaneous pacing. So there are two elements to verify and capture. Does anyone know what those are? Well, if you said electrical and mechanical, you'd be absolutely correct. So you have to have both electrical capture and mechanical capture, um, but you can't get mechanical capture without electrical capture. So let's talk about a case. You have a 56 year old female uh, who's in the park on a nice fall cool day with her child and they're just having a good time and suddenly she develops uh, bradycardia, hypotension, and altered mental status. And you obtain a 12 lead. She's having some vague symptoms. But you know that females sometimes don't present with classic signs and symptoms. So you get a 12 lead. And this is what it shows. Um, she's also altered. So you decide she's altered. She's very symptomatic. She's unstable. I have to pace her. So you put on the pads and you start pacing her. Um, so you start off at 70 a minute, 40 milliamps. And then you're thinking, I don't, I don't think I have capture. So what do you do? Um, you increase it to 50 milliamps. And then do you think you have capture? Well, you don't think you have capture. You're not really sure, but you're pretty sure you don't. You might feel a pulse. You might not feel a pulse. Or you don't think you feel a pulse, but somebody says, I think I feel a pulse. So you just err on the side of caution and you increase it to 70 milliamps. So you're still at, you went from 70 a minute to 80 a minute because you thought, well, it might help. Don't know. So now you're pacing at 70 milliamps. And you say, I've got capture. The patient's woke up a little bit. Uh, I feel a pulse. And mental status has improved some. And maybe even the blood pressure increased. But are you sure? Are you 100% sure that you got capture? And how can you be sure? So generally, we say that I felt a pulse, the mental status improved, and the blood pressure improved. And on this case, they said, well, we have mechanical capture because we saw a pacer spike, and then we saw a complex following that spike, right? And then they felt a pulse, the patient woke up, and the blood pressure went up. So let's do a quick review. Remember, you can't get mechanical capture without electrical capture. So, let's see how good we are at identifying electrical capture first. All right. So, let's take a look. Let me pull my pointer up here. You've got um, pacer spike, pacer spike, pacer spike. Okay. So, the beats following these look like some sort of maybe capture, I'm not sure. But you've got a pacer spike and you've got some uh, complex following that. So look at these and pause it if you need to and think which beats have capture. So there are only three beats, 9, 11, and 14 that have capture. Now I, I, I gave this lecture in front of a group of physicians and ask them the same thing. And one physician got it right, right off the bat. And only one physician knew which beats uh, had electrical capture and which did not. And I said, that's that's good job. You did a good job. How did you know? He said, well, I just came from the cath lab where a patient was bradycardic. They started pacing, and that's what it looked like. And I said, that's one way to do it. So if the beat on the left here has capture, and the bead on the right does not, because if you would go back, you'd see that I said that is not capture. Then what is it? All right. 
Well, I'm going to explain. And I want to show how this beat right there is not captured and how I know that they don't have capture because you can see the patient's native beat or intrinsic beat still showing up on the refractory period, the absolute refractory period of the pace beat. So um, if you had capture, then the heart would be refractory to any impulses. So you would not get a QRS complex. You could not. The patient's intrinsic heart, native heart rhythm could not generate a, an impulse, an electrical impulse during that period. Then this beat, if you look, it's got a characteristically different morphology from, uh, from this one right here. So it's got a wide QRS, a tall, and very broad T wave. It looks much like um, what you would expect from a pacemaker rhythm because now, instead of going down the normal conduction pathway, we're actually capturing the ventricles and their slower conduction from cell to cell. This is, then what is this? <laughs> I was going to say what it was, but what is this beat, right? Because it looks like what we would expect capture to look like. That is a phantom complex. This is false capture. And it's a phenomenon that a lot of people don't know about. They're not taught. And um, the simulations that we run using, you know, the rhythm generator, they don't do it justice. So you can see they can be little, they can be large, and they can be pretty large. All of these are not capture. This is pacing artifact. And let's look at this in terms of uh, milliamps. So if you start off at 20 milliamps, and this was an actual case, you start off at 20 milliamps, you'll see there's a little tiny blip after the pacer spike. Then when you go up to 30 milliamps, it gets bigger, and then you go up to 40, it gets even bigger. So the higher milliamps you go, the higher this uh, phantom complex, or the more voltage this phantom complex is going to have. There's only one monitor manufacturer who recognizes this. So when, when the uh, monitor delivers an impulse, it closes its eyes for a split second because if it didn't, it would look like a defibrillation. Okay, You've seen when you defibrillate a patient, how it goes off the page. If it didn't close its eyes during that, that, that uh, when it paces, then you wouldn't be able to see anything that follows because it would just look like a big shock. But sometimes um, you can see a portion following uh, the pace beat. So some of that electrical artifact remains, okay? And it can resemble a QRS complex. Um, and Philips is the only manufacturer that I have found that has actually reported on this. But all of them have the same problem. Um, they say, despite the blanking period after the pace pull, some of the ECG artifact may remain and a portion may be seen immediately following the pace pulse. This artifact morphology is variable and at times may resemble AQR's complex so that it can be confused with capture as in the strip below. Uh, so what we're used to seeing is on a rhythm gener generator is, oh, we have a uh, little pacer spike here. Nothing follow it, following it, right? Then that's the patient's native beat, another, uh, another pacing spike, and nothing following it. So it's either we have capture or we don't. There's no, I'm not sure. And in the real world, there's a lot of unsures. So, if I say if <clears throat> if I'm saying that uh, filling for a pulse, uh, looking for improvement in mental status, and looking for an increase in blood pressure is not the best way to verify mechanical capture, then how do you do it? All right, so this is not good. That's not even good enough, and that's not good enough. This was a patient that I had that I personally cared for, and we get called for someone who has vomiting and diarrhea. She's sitting on the toilet, very diaphoretic. She just looks sick, 
and I'm car- I carried my monitor in. I'm throwing her on the monitor, and I obtain a three lead, and I see initially her heart rate was just like 30 or 40. My partner went to go get the stretcher while I was hooking her up, and she goes unresponsive. And then I see this on the monitor, so ventricular asystole with just like some very sporadic, spurious uh, um, agonal beats. And she was not perfusing her brain. She was not responding to pain, and I couldn't feel for a pulse. So, um, you know, in the heat of the moment, I kind of rationalized in my head, well, I either have to start CPR or I need to pace and I need to get capture. So I quickly applied the pads, and I started pacing. Now, a lot of people would say, well, if you didn't have a pulse, you shouldn't be pacing, right? The 2015 uh, European Resuscitation Council guidelines say that you should consider. Now, I agree this is not the American Heart Association, and I I may have made a mistake in pacing this patient um, because, uh, you know what, at the time, uh, I was by myself. I was the my adrenaline was was like through the roof, and that's just what I did. But I went back and I looked at the 2015 ERC guidelines, and they say consider pacing in patients with symptomatic bradycardia, refractory to anticholinergic drugs or other second line therapy. Um, and then they go on to say, whenever a diagnosis of asystole is made, check the ECG carefully for the presence of P waves because this will likely respond to cardiac pacing. So the rationale is that if you have P waves, then there's at least enough cardiac substrate uh, for the atria to still contract. Um, But there's a disconnect between the atria and the ventricles. Um, Now, I'm clearly not advocating for pacing asystole ever, right? There's a reason we don't do it anymore. Um, But... This is what I did, and physiologically, I think that it is interesting. This is not the American Heart Association. This is the European Resuscitation Council guidelines, not American Heart Association. So, like, we can't do this. Um, But I did it. I flipped a coin. I tried pacing, and here's what happened. So you'll see a pacing pacing spike. Uh, Then you'll see a uh, kind of wide QRS, but you see this big, broad T wave. And I immediately knew that I got capture. How did I know that I got capture? Well, because the patient went from being unresponsive and not having a pulse to trying to sit up, grabbing my shirt, yelling because she didn't know what was going on. Um, There's another way I knew that I had capture. I saw a regular SPO2 pleth right here uh, that corresponded with every pace beat right there. Um, And then you can see that I started pacing at 70 and 115 milliamps because I wanted to leave nothing to chance because it was either I get captured now or I'm doing CPR. This was another case that I went on and I got in the back of the ambulance. I was called for assistance. And the paramedic said, hey Floyd, will you look at the monitor? I'm pacing, I think I have capture, but I'm not sure. I said, okay, what are you pacing at? And she said, 30 milliamps. And I said, well, I'm pretty sure you probably don't have capture. Um, It's very rare to get capture below 70 or 80 milliamps. So 30 milliamps, there's almost uh, no way that you're going to get capture. So I saw what I shared with you earlier, phantom complexes, uh, intrinsic beats in the absolute refractory period. So it increased it to 80, from 30 to 80. Now we're getting intermittent capture, right? Intermittent capture. So that's still a phantom complex, phantom complex, true capture, true capture. So then we went from 80 to 90, and we've got consistent capture, and we had a regular SBO2 waveform for every pace beat. This was another case that I was on. Um, it was a patient who we trans- transferred from one hospital to another that was on a ventilator. And um, she went into cardiac arrest. They, they obtained a pulse back. Then she would just keep re-arresting. And the hospital was pleading with us to transport her because 
They had her maxed out on norepi, epi, and uh, they thought her only chance of surviving would was to go to a hospital that could uh, perform some kind of intervention, maybe ECMO or something like that. So we transported her. She would Brady down. We would give a milligram of epi, even though she was already on epi, and uh, we'd have to start CPR, and within a minute we could pulse back. So we attempted pacing. Uh, you can see I went up to 200 milliamps, and I, I couldn't feel a pulse. But she had a weak pulse to begin with, and, of course, her extremities were contracting because the muscles were contracting from the pacing. And uh, her CO2 was really, really low. And uh, these, to me, look like uh, phantom complexes and false capture. But you can see I had the SpO2 probe on. And I did have a regular, um, a regular SpO2 uh, plef for every pace beat, and you can see that um, it ca counted the pulse rate at 78 via the SpO2 plef. Uh, and I shared this with an expert on transcutaneous pacing, and I said, "Hey, uh, I need you to look at this. I was just curious if I actually had capture or not." And he said, "You probably did." But in that circumstance where you have the QRS morphology that doesn't look like true capture should, and in a patient that's already hypoperfused and yet, yet you have no other way of knowing, then um, he said what you did was probably the right thing to do. And just uh, stop pacing and start CPR. So let's go back to our uh, original case where they said capture obtained. Okay. We went up to 70 milliamps and we've got capture, but did they? What do you think now? They did not. They did not have capture. Um, so we only had an SpO2 plef at a rate of 44, which matched perfectly the patient's intrinsic uh, rate. And then all of these complexes are just phantom complexes. What? <laughs> all right, so our, this is my approach. To transcutaneous pacing and we've had some cases where the patient was being paced and the paramedic called for med control orders um, and obtained orders to to you know to adjust the rate or the milliamps and there's no good direction on where we should start when pacing patients how high we should go before we stop um, and I recently had a discussion with Dr. Hilty about this, and we'll probably be changing our protocol pretty soon. Uh, but right now, the protocol doesn't give you much direction. So here is my approach. Um, is the patient perfusing their brain? If yes, and they're bradycardic, then you need to think, do you really need to pace them? You can try epi or dopamine. Um, both are within the ACLS guidelines. If they're not perfusing their brain, i.e. they're peri-arrest, they're about to code, then start high, all right? Because you saw that you can start if the patient's trending downward and they're about to arrest, and you can start at 30 and go up to 35 and 40, and by the time you get to where you need to be to obtain capture, uh, the patient would have likely arrested again, and we've seen that. I'm sure you've seen it too. So um, there's a time to be cautious, and there's a time where I need to get captured or the patient's going to arrest. Um, now, I can't prescribe a certain rate that and milliamps that you need to start at because our protocol really doesn't give much direction. Uh, but remember, patients rarely get you, you will rarely get capture below uh, 75 or 80. And there's nothing saying that if you start higher and you get capture uh, that you can't titrate down and then you'll see intermittent capture and then you can take it up just a little bit. Uh, the, the HA even says that uh, there are limited studies comparing transcutaneous pacing with drug therapy for the treatment of symptomatic bradycardia. Um, atropine were compa was compared with TCP showed a few differences in outcome and survival, although TCP group obtained a more consistent 
heart rate. Who would have thought? Uh, when they compare pacing with dopamine, no differences were observed between treatment groups and survival to hospital discharge. Transcutaneous pacing is at best a temporizing measure. It's painful in conscious patients, and whether effective or not, um, and in quotations, they say achieving inconsistent capture, the patient should be prepared for transvenous pacing and expert consultation should be obtained. Uh, this was just an algorithm I wanted to share, and uh, I found it. It's an anesthesiologist algorithm for bradycardia, and I really like that they have you consider, you know, could it be auto peep, check SD segment T wave, could it be pulmonary embolism, could it be hyperkalemia? Because frequently patients with hyperkalemia develop bradyarrhythmias. So their algorithm if, is if they have poor perfusion, um, measure oxygen, ventilation, IV fluids wide open, secure the airway, consider atropine. Um, if in effect, it begin transcutaneous pacing. But their algorithm has you administering IV bolus epi 10 to 100 mics. That is 0.1 milligram. Um, if response, if they respond to epi, then they have them starting a drip. Um, so here's just a rough outline of a potential way to manage a patient. Now, this is not endorsing this particular algorithm, but this is how I think about it. And uh, if I called for orders um, to get orders for sedation or analgesia, this is how I would approach it and what I would specifically ask for if indicated. So if the patient is wet and cannot parry rest, good rule of thumb is to start at 80 and uh, 80 and 80. Now, Dr. Hilty in discussion with him said that if you're having trouble getting electrical and mechanical capture, consider decreasing your rate. Because if you decrease your rate, um, the heart is refractory for a longer period of time after, after the pacing has stopped. So there's more time for repolarization, which might help you uh, achieve capture. Okay. So then, of course, if they're awake, if they're conscious, you want to sedate. You want to provide sedation and analgesia um, within your protocol. And then verify capture by noting an increase in entitled CO2 and ensuring the SpO2 plef matches the paced rate. And always don't let your bradycardic patient die. So consider drugs, a beta blocker overdose, consider glucagon. If there's ischemia, then you want to transport them to a PCI center. And always think about your electrolytes, namely hyperkalemia. Search for peak T waves and a widened QRS. Um, now, we don't have calcium chloride, but uh, hopefully when our protocols get approved, we will. Um, and then, if you can't get capture with the anterolateral position, try the anterior posterior position. Now make sure that you don't put the pad over the sternum and you don't put the pad over the spine. Um, and the goal here is to sandwich the heart. In theory, if you sandwich the heart, then you're going to um, hopefully um, catch more of it with your pacing pulse. And if you have any questions, uh, comments, thoughts on this, I would love to hear them. Thank you.